This is the fourth, fourth message in our sermon series. We've been talking about lessons of faith from the first Christmas. And this morning we're going to settle into the part of the story that deals mostly with the Magi, but it's also a story about Herod. The two of them come together and there is this moment of encounter and it's written into the story of Jesus' birth, and it's a significant moment. And the title of this message is The Magi's Journey of Honor. Each week we've looked at a little bit of a journey that each individual in this uh, story took. And, and, and this particular one, we're talking about the Magi, there is a journey of honor that they go on. And there's, there's multiple things we'll see uh, in their story, but I, I love the word and the concept and the idea of honor. It's something that I think God calls us uh, into, and we see it play out in the story of Christ. If you guys would jump in with me, uh, if you have your notes, that's fine. Uh, we're going to jump into Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 to kick this part of the story off and this is what it says it says now after jesus was born in bethlehem of judea in the days of herod the king behold magi from the east arrived in jerusalem saying where is he who has been born king of the jews for we saw his star in the east and we've come to worship him and the first thing I want to ask is, what compelled the Magi to go and to find Jesus? You know, we, we read this story, and, and it's almost like in this story, all of a sudden we're introduced to these characters who just show up one day with a bunch of gifts for Jesus. And, and we, we, we probably heard different uh, uh, stories or explanations about each of the gifts, but these were important gifts, gifts that were uh, uh, worthy of a king. And they, they, what, and they came and they offered these uh, to Jesus. And of course, again, there is symbolism in this, but I often question why? Why did these guys travel to go see uh, this king? And I think in order to be able to understand why they made this kind of a trip, we need to understand a little bit more about the Magi themselves. Now, if you're any kind of a, a wordsmith at all and you like etymology, you'll see a similarity between the word Magi and magic. And in their day and age, they would have been considered wise soothsayers. They would have been sorcerers of, of a sort. And, and, and I think what we think of when we think of sorcery, we're thinking like Harry Potter kind of stuff. But this was different. These were aged men, men who had been uh, educated in both the natural realms and sciences and also in supernatural uh, understanding. And they would have been studied in astrology and astronomy and all kinds of different things related to the human experience. And they would have been considered experts in their day and age. The kind of experts that kings, when they had problems, would seek out men like this, and they would call them in to give, get, get some explanation into what exactly uh, was going on. And they would come up with conclusions, again, that were natural and supernatural. And, and it, was a, it was a bigger thing than what we think of. They weren't just academics. They weren't just sorcerers. They weren't just magicians. They were wise not men who were knowledgeable about all things that had to do with humanity. And so when you start to understand that and you recognize that these were men who were looking into the heavens, looking for signs, looking for ways of understanding and interpreting events, that what you realize is there was a moment that was powerful enough for them as they looked into the heavens that they recognized something significant was going on. Now I think that we, uh, we take for granted the idea of travel. Uh, how many of you follow friends on Facebook that seem to travel everywhere all the time? And they've got great pictures and stories from going all over the earth. I mean, you know, they were in Hawaii this week and they're in Europe next week. And boy, wouldn't you love to be able to go on some of those trips with them. It looks exciting. But we take for granted that travel 
is easy and it's simple for us. We can hop on a plane and be halfway across the world within a day. And we can be in a destination that used to take months or even longer to get to. Well, in their day and age, travel was a serious thing. It wasn't something that you just did willy-nilly and you just didn't just wake up one day and say, hey, I'm going to France. You planned for it. You put together all the things that you needed. You put together people to go on the journey with you. There was all kinds of provisions and finances and things that had to be assembled before you could go on, especially this kind of a journey. Now, how old was Jesus about that we know of? And we'll figure this out as we go through the story a little bit more. But he was about two years old. And it's my estimation that these men who came from the east were on a journey that took them about two years to find Jesus. So when you think about that and you think about this story, you have to really look into these guys and understand that something in their universe, something in their understanding was happening that was so big, so significant, that they were willing to go and to find it. No matter what the cost no matter how long it took, and no longer, no matter what it took to get there, they were going to go find him. And I think that that is an incredible testimony to what it is that they recognized in the stars. What it is that they recognized from their teaching and their reading and their understanding of the universe around them. This just wasn't something they did one day. This was what their whole life became about for a few years because if it took them two years to get to see Jesus you need to understand it took them about two years to get back this was four years or more of their life we don't know a hundred percent but it could have been five years six years in the preparation and in all the expense and in all the gathering and going and coming back this was something that was big enough for them that they would expend five years of their life to go and to find and to seek this was important. And it wasn't just that what they saw was there was this king that was born. How many of you understand that kings and queens were born all the time? This was bigger than that. This was perhaps in their estimation from what they were looking at and what they were seeing, this perhaps was something that was so monumental that it would change all of history and they wanted to be a part of that. Oh, if we had a church full of magi who would do anything to go after and seek out the Lord and His truth. And so these guys went on this huge journey. Now, how many of you understand there was a lot of peril along those kinds of journeys? There were people on those pathways, those ancient roads who were looking to rob and to pilfer and to steal and to kill and to do all kinds of things. This was kind of worse than the Wild West when we think about it because there was really no protection. There was really no provision. You went along on your journey and you kind of did so at your own expense. And when you have to provide for years worth of resources, how many of you know that makes a really nice target if you're the kind of person who's unscrupulous and isn't afraid to do evil things to get money? And so when you even think about this, we always think because there were three gifts mentioned that there were three dudes. Right? I mean, I told you last week my wife has all these nativity scenes. When you think of nativity scenes, first of all, they weren't there. I hate to break this news to you, but even if we get beyond that fact, there's always three wise men, and they always have one of the three gifts in their hands, right? This was an entourage. This was a happening. There were most more likely uh, uh, in their party of people, there were you know, more than just three magi. There were just three gifts. So this could have been, who knows, it could have been a dozen, it could have been a couple dozen. We don't know how many actual magi were on this journey, but surrounding them were most likely their families. 
And beyond that were probably men who were uh, 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 soldiers and, and, and people who could protect and keep them safe on their journey. And most likely, they were sent there with the blessing of the leaders from the countries that they came from. And we don't know exactly where they came from, just that it was east. They could have come all the way from China. We don't know. And there was no speed in their journey. This took time, but they were willing to do it because of what they saw, what they understood, and they wanted to be a part of it. So when you read that into this, the story opens up a little bit more because you start to understand what they did to get to where they were. And of course, when they come to Israel, what do you think they're looking for? They're looking for a king, so they're going to go to who? The current king, right? Because if there was a child, if there was a king that was born, the most likely place that that would have happened would have been in the king's house. It would have been a royal child that they were looking for. And so they come, they show up in Israel, and the first thing that they do is they go to seek out the reigning ruler. Now, the reigning ruler at the time was a guy named Herod, and I want to give you a little bit of insight into who Herod was. Now, there are two Herods we encounter in the story and life of Jesus. There is Herod that we're talking about here who dies when Jesus is about approximately four years old. Then there's Herod we read about in later on in Jesus' life who actually is a part of the whole trial and punishment of Jesus. Um, He is an heir of this Herod, but this Herod is a different dude. We need to understand a little bit about Herod, but they show up to Herod who is an ethnarch. That's a big word, okay? I'm going to throw a few of these at you today. But he was an ethnarch, which means he was ethnically the ruler of Israel. But who was really in charge of Israel? Rome. They were under Roman occupation, but he would have been the, at the time, they would have had a king over the land that would have reported back to Rome and would have run the place on Rome's behalf. This was Herod. Now, there's a few things that make this dude a particularly interesting character in the story, and it gives you a little bit of insight into the troubles that they would uh, inherit as they went to talk to him. The first thing is this, is that he was an outsider. What do we know about Herod? If you're in your notes, he was an outsider. Herod was not ethnically actually a Jew. He was actually an Edomite, which means that he was the, uh, from the ancestry of Esau, Of course, we know there was Jacob and there was Esau. Esau was supposed to be the one from which the lineage of Israel would come, right? But uh, Esau was tricked by his brother Jacob and he gave up his birthright. But Esau still lived and Esau still had children and Esau still had descendants. And they were kind of considered pretty close in proximity when it came to ethnicity to the Jews because they all came from the same patriarch. But yet they weren't really Jews. And so he was from the land of Edom, which was, again, it was the, the, those that came from the, the lineage of Esau. And uh, earlier on, before Herod was born, uh, they, they had conquered Edomites, the Edomites. And they brought them into uh, the kingdom that existed. And under this occupation of the Edomites, you had families that were powerful in uh, that land who then became pressed into service to serve and to rule in the land of Israel that we think of today. This was how Herod sort of got his way in. But he was always an outsider. He was never truly one of them. He was sort of kind of like them, and he had power over them. He was given authority, but he wasn't one of them. He was an outsider. Have you ever been an outsider into anything? All you want to be is on the inside. All you want to be is like the rest. You feel awkward and, and, and out of place and out of sorts. And this was Herod's story. He was an outsider. 
He'd been raised in a powerful family. This was a dude who understood what power was. He understood how you use power. He was raised from a a young age to be a leader and even to be a ruthless leader. So he was an outsider who was raised in systems of power, not only in his family, but those he was surrounded by. As a young man, he was actually elevated to the level of governor by a man named Hyrcanus, the first. Hyrcanus I was a priest in Judaism who also became the leading uh, 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 Jew in Israel, the, the ethnarch, if you will, of, that, of his time. And in that period of time, he was raised up and made in, in, a governor. He was always around power. He knew power, and he knew how to run with power. And at some point... Everything shifted fully in this man's favor when it came to his leadership. And it goes like this, Hyrcanus' son, Hyrcanus II, he was uh, the ethnarch at the time. He had taken the, the throne of his father. And during the time of his reign, he had some family, a nephew that came in and overthrew him from his seat of power. Now, he didn't kill Hyrcanus II, and so Herod ran to Rome. On his own fruition, he was fiercely loyal to that family. He ran to Rome and he said to Rome, Hey, I want you to know something that just took place over here in one of these uh, kingdoms that you you control. This is what went on. He says, Can you uh, send some military presence into that area and put Hyrcanus II back on his throne to which you had placed him? And the Roman officials looked at Herod and they said, we'll do even better than that. We're going to send a legion back with you. You go kick that person out of their uh, seat of power and we'll make you king. And so Herod, probably a middle-aged man, walks out of Rome with Rome's full power and authority to run, to reign, and to rule in the nation of Israel. And the last thing you really have to understand about Herod is he was brutal. He was an outsider, always looking in from the outside. He was someone trained in how to use power. He was given the full backing and authority of Rome. And he was brutal in keeping his power. He had his wife killed at one point. Three of his sons 300 military leaders he had slaughtered because he wanted to make sure that everybody was in alignment with him and anybody he suspected who wasn't he had them he had them killed so when you think about who this guy is you need to understand all of these things because the stern the, the 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 hornet's nest that gets stirred in these moments in this story come from a place of a guy who was in his 70s at the time he was looking literally to create a dynasty he had set up his power he had a seat of power he was the ultimate authority he was going to pass that power on to his children and he was going to create a dynasty that would last for generations that was going to be a testimony of his power and a testimony to his achievements And of course, we know he did some pretty amazing things. There were things that he did that were good. We know of Herod's temple, don't we? The Temple Mount, as you think of it today, was built by Herod. But he was a man of great achievements, great power. But he was brutal, and he was mean. And he could do some downright awful things if he felt at any moment that his power was being usurped. So they go before the king when they come into Israel and they ask this simple question. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Who was born? Ain't nobody born in Herod's house. Herod's children were all old. They were adults. He was an old man. This wasn't talking about somebody who was in his lineage. So how is a guy like that going to respond to that sort of a question? 
Matthew 2, 3 says this, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. Why was, he, why was everybody troubled with Herod? Who the heck cares if some guys went in to talk to Herod? That ain't my business. Didn't come talk to me. All of Jerusalem was troubled because they knew how bad this could get. Herod was troubled. He was upset. He was beginning to contemplate what was going on and he was beginning to already equate a threat to his throne and his rule and his dynasty and all the things that he had worked his whole entire life to build. There was a threat against that and so he was troubled. And when the king got troubled, the people were troubled with him. Not because they cared about Herod, but because they cared about themselves and they understood that what was coming next might not be so good. And then this is what he does after he contemplates. Matthew 2, 4 through 6, it says this. Gathering all of the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. Now, do you think he really was concerned about where the Messiah was born? They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders in Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. And I think there's a couple of things we need to understand. Herod knew exactly what these magi were talking about. You see, while other people may have been just thinking like the Magi, that they were looking for some king. Maybe he was a significant king. He was certainly significant enough for them to travel as far as they did. But they were looking for an earthly type of a king, a child, a prince that was born, that they could come and that they could honor and that they could worship. And, and, and people maybe outside would have been thinking in the same terms. But Herod actually nails this because he asks the chief priest where the Messiah would be born. In other words, the promised one of Israel, he understood that what they were looking for was more than a king. Although even in their own understanding, they felt like this would be a king that would come because it was going to be a ruler in the lineage, in the line of David. And there was all kinds of kingdom talk around Jesus in the, in the prophetic scriptures in the Old Testament. But he understood. He cut right to the heart. He knew these guys came. What they're really looking for is not a king that was born in my house. What they're looking for is this promised one that had been promised to the Jews. You know, he was an outsider, but he was raised around a priest. So he had heard things and he knew things, but he obviously didn't know enough because he didn't know exactly where this would happen or how it would happen. So he inquired of the chief priests and he asked them where the messiah was going to be born because he was going to take care of business this was a threat to his throne because he was not of the lineage of david he wasn't going to be king over israel and any more than he was there was no a promise of his throne or whatever this was a threat to him so he inquired of them where this would happen. And of course, they let the cat out of the bag. They told him in Bethlehem, in Judea. And so now he had a place. Now he had to figure out a little bit more. So we, again, we see the Magi, they come in. And they seek court with Herod once again. Who knows, maybe they were invited there to come back because now he was really trying to figure some things out here. And it says in Matthew 2, 7 through 9, and then we jump down to 12, this is what it says. And Herod secretly called the Magi. By the way, if you ever get called into a secret meeting, it's no good. <laughs> Just giving you that heads up. 
But Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I may too, or I may come and worship him. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the, marriage, the Magi left for their own country by another way. So now he wants to know, okay, how long ago did you find this star? Because if this star is a symbol of this child that was born, then that gives us a basic time frame of how old this child might be. And then he tells them, hey, why don't you guys go, and when you go, you find exactly where this child is, and then you tell me so that I can go and that I can worship this child too. Of course, we know that that's not what Herod exactly wants to do. But they don't know that. You know, we read into these stories all the time, knowing the conclusion. We know the outcome. We know what occurs after the fact. But there was a moment where the Magi had to make some decisions. They were standing before the king in a foreign land. They were exposed. They were not in a place where they had power. They were subject to the power of this man. And probably they had heard that he was not maybe the kindest guy. And so they're standing before him and he calls them in and he talks to them and he says, look, go and find this child and come back and let me know so that I can go find him too. And, you know, if you're these guys, maybe you just believe this guy. Okay, this guy wants to know too and we came here for all of this so this would be a part of the story and so maybe it is good for us to go and find this child and introduce this king to this child. We have to believe that they probably believed Herod because had not for angelic visitation, they might have done exactly what he said. And so there was intervention on God's behalf. But I want you to understand something. We're talking about magi here. These were not Jews. These were not men who had been raised in the faith of God. They were not raised to know the Lord themselves. They were not raised under their religious system. In fact, these guys probably believed and ascribed to uh, uh, Eastern uh, mysticism and other religious ideas and ideologies. They didn't know God, per se, but they understood supernatural things on some level, and I think it's really interesting that these guys are woven into this story, but in this moment where they have to make a decision, God shows up. And I want you to understand, this is a little bit of a side note, but I want you to understand something. When you are in tune with God, and you have to make decisions, and you have to do things in life, God will come, and God will communicate, and God will intervene on your behalf. So God intervenes in this situation, and he he tells them what's going on. Now, we know that they did go and they saw the child. We know that they presented these gifts. We know that there was this moment where they were with Mary and Joseph and Jesus and perhaps other family that were surrounding them and people of their village and the whole thing. There was this great big moment about this child. And could you imagine the rumors that must have spread about these magi that came to visit Joseph and Mary's boy? And so they, they, they're, they're there, they get to experience this, this angel comes, and I find it interesting because it said not only that they just left and went home, it said they went back, what? By another way. They were smart enough to realize that by leaving, without going back to Herod, that Herod would probably send some people out to go grab them. And probably under threat of death or whatever imprisonment or whatever torture, he would have tried to extract the truth of where this child was. So they went a different way. 
which might not have been a convenient way. It might have added days, months, maybe even a year to their travel by going a different way. But they went a different way because that's what they were told to do by the Lord and it kept the secret of the child. And then what happens? In Matthew 2, 16 through 17, it says, Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all of the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi, then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. How sick. How evil. And all of this just to protect himself. Now there's a lot of things that get speculated around how many people this really means. And if you really understand anything about uh, history, I mean there's uh, different uh, numbers. But this is probably, and it, it may sound trivial to some extent, but this is probably a couple dozen boys. The village of Bethlehem at the time would have been probably, they speculate, about 300 inhabitants, maybe a little bit more, who knows. I love when you have academics who try to tell you everything about a t- period of time they never lived in. <laughs> with assuredness that they know everything. But maybe there was a few hundred, maybe there was a thousand, who knows. And then you have to think about how that boils down. So maybe there was a couple dozen boys that were slaughtered in this slaughtering of children. But let me tell you something. It really mattered to those moms. And it really mattered to those dads. And it really mattered to that village. And it really mattered to the people that were in that area because they saw the brutal power of a dictator who came and murdered innocent children all for his own sake. The unfortunate part is that in doing so, he actually fulfilled prophecy, a sign of what was going to happen in the time of Christ. Now, we're not reading this part of the story, but we know that in the moments of all this happening, that the Mary and Joseph fled. They went to Egypt because they had had a dream and a vision. So all these Dreams and visitations happened at one moment. The Magi went in one direction. Mary and Joseph went another direction. And of course, then Jesus was saved and spared. But I want to ask this question as we close. What is it we can learn from the Magi? Because there's not a whole lot of good stuff to learn from Herod. Here's what you need to learn about Herod. Don't be a Herod. Now let's move on to the Magi. The first thing we need to learn from them is not to be afraid of men. They came with purpose. They came to accomplish something. They came to honor this child whose star they saw. And when they arrived, there was so much pressure on them over this child and over this situation. They could have caved to that pressure. They could have done what man wanted them to do, to give up the whereabouts of this child and to give them more insight into this situation. But they chose instead, really, ultimately, to honor God and to not fear men. I think it's a good lesson for the church today. I think we as a people need to learn to be more like the Magi and not be afraid of what men can do. But to carry the mission of Christ that we have been commissioned to do by him. Second thing is that they were willing to do whatever it took to find Jesus. Now I let the cat out of the bag on that one a little bit earlier, but I'm telling you, they were willing to do whatever it took to get there. And oftentimes we have this attitude with God where it's like, 
We keep putting them off. Whenever I get time, whatever it's convenient for me, whatever the case is, and we don't have that little bit of hunger, whatever you want to call it, in our soul, in our heart, that we say, I will do whatever it takes to seek out the Lord and to find Him. I will do whatever it takes to do what God has asked of me. And the third thing, and I think that this is important, and we can't overlook it, they were worshipers. They didn't come just to meet the king. They weren't looking for some benefit that they could get out of finding this child. There was nothing really in it for them. They came literally to give this child gifts. And as the Bible says, they worshipped him. They were worshippers at heart. In other words, they were looking for God in this. And they were seeking after connecting with him in that place of worship. And I think for us, God's people, it should be no different. That's a good lesson that we should learn, is that we should come to the Lord not with agenda, not with a what's in it for me kind of an attitude, and how can God do nice things for me, because I hate to tell you, a lot of the church, that's the church's attitude towards God. I need help, I need this, I need that, God make my life great, whatever it is. And all they wanted to do was worship. Maybe if we became worshipers like they were worshipers, we wouldn't have to worry about God fixing all of our nonsense. And so this morning, as we close, I want to invite you into being like the Magi. And as we think about the story of Christmas and the examples of those who were testified about, we could use a little bit of what they gave as an example. So we're going to do this. We're going to close. We'll have our, worship, our, our um, prayer team come forward. And as always, I want to invite you into a relationship with Jesus Christ this morning. You've never given your life to Jesus. Now is a good time to come forward and say yes and amen to him. To receive forgiveness of sins and to live our lives in a way that not only honors the Lord but gives us purpose and meaning and a hope to look forward to. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, today is a good day. For some of you, and I give this invitation to those who have maybe made a decision before in our lives. That we've walked away, we've gotten off track, we've gotten into things that we know we shouldn't be into. Now's the time to get back in alignment with Him. So we open up the altar for you if you need to come forward and just say, you know what, Lord, I need to get myself, and you know we're coming up to a new year, now's a good time. And for some of you, you just need someone to pray over you. You need somebody to just help by praying over a situation, things that are going on in your life that you just need God to intervene in, come forward and receive prayer. Today is a great day to see God move in your life. I'm telling you something, God will. Amen? Let's do this. Let's stand up. We'll have the prayer team come on up. And if you need to come forward and receive prayer, come forward before you leave. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning. And in the spirit of Christmas, which is a spirit of promises kept by God to humanity, Lord, we pray for a contrite heart, Lord, where we might come humbly before you. And this morning, Lord, if there's someone who needs to get their life on track with the Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would put it in their heart, Lord, by your spirit to come forward and receive the gift of Jesus today. Lord, for those that are struggling, there's things going on in their lives, things aren't always perfect, and Lord, we know that you can come and you can minister and you can intervene. 
Lord, I pray that you would send those people forward, that they might receive this morning and walk out of here relieved and blessed, Lord. And so, God, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord, just for the story that we can read in the scripture of your coming, of the birth of Christ and those that surrounded him. Lord, there are lessons that each one of us can learn. We pray, Lord, that we would not just let this holiday, this holy day, slip by without reflecting on these moments. And Lord, I pray that you would transform our hearts and our minds, that we might be made in the image of Jesus himself. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.